Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming up your way. When we were taping last week's episode, we do tape this uh, a couple of years ago. We had a live show. Unfortunately, things got changed around where we had to go to tape. We had the uh, Catherine Blasey Ford, Dr. Ford, and uh, Judge Brett Kavanaugh hearings that were airing the same time we were taping, so we never really got a chance to, dis to discuss that. As you've heard by now, I don't think there's anybody out there who hasn't heard the news, that uh, the matter was voted out of committee by an 11 to 10 vote, contingent upon, of course, a week-long FBI investigation. Well, the FBI report came in late last night. Senate has reviewed it today. There's a vote scheduled for Saturday. Who knows how this is going to end? I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing last week's hearing because this is really wrapping up and pretty soon it's going to be old news. However, this is going to have some implications long beyond this week and whether or not Kavanaugh gets confirmed or not through the, the full Senate vote, you know, the implications of course are going to be long lasting. If he gets voted down, then you know that um, it's probably going to be a backlash against the Democrats at the polls. If he gets voted in, we're going to have Judge Brett Kavanaugh on the court for the next 30 to 35 years. So that's the way that that's going to play out. We're not going to get too much into that, but right now this may very well be a pivot point in the election, and that's really what we're going to discuss today. So before we get into the content and a, and a lot of stuff, we're going to go right to our Prager University segment today. And this has to deal kind of with the Judge Kavanaugh, Dr. Ford hearings in uh, the, asking the question, who needs feminism? So let's take a look. I am an anti-feminist. Feminism is a mean-spirited, small-minded, and oppressive philosophy that can poison relations between the sexes. Relations which, for most of us, provide some of life's deepest pleasures and consolations. Feminism has attempted to bully us all into accepting an obvious lie. The lie that men and women have the same powers, talents, proclivities, and desires, and that consequently, any discrepancy in their professional paths is due to bigotry and must be corrected by force of culture and law. By shoving that lie down our throats, feminism has made both men and women less happy and less free. Now, I'm going to have to speak in generalities, and I understand there are all kinds of exceptions to what I'm about to say, but the generalities remain generally valid. Feminism denigrates masculinity in men by relentlessly calling us toxic for our flaws rather than appreciating our natural qualities of energy, risk-taking, and leadership. But it also denigrates femininity in women, working to replace most women's commitment to relationship and child-rearing with male obsessions, such as career status and strength. What's the result? Take a look at the quintessential feminist icon, Rosie the Riveter, flexing her muscle. The truth is, any man of the same size and fitness can make a bigger, stronger muscle than Rosie can. By herding women away from their feminine natures, feminism seeks to transform them from first-rate women into second-rate men. Now, perhaps you'll protest. Isn't feminism simply the idea that women have the same human rights as men? No, it isn't. That philosophy is called classical liberalism, which holds that we are all equally endowed by God with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But wait, doesn't the Declaration of Independence say that all men are created equal? Yes, classical liberalism was an idea conceived by, and largely for, Christian white men. But, like all ideas, good and bad, classical liberalism has evolved over time according to its internal logic, so it now includes all races and both sexes. Good job, Christian white men. Thanks for the great idea. As its excuse for the damage it does to our lives, Feminism has developed the historical mythology that men have oppressed women and now must be suppressed in their turn to even things out. Let me propose a different narrative that has the advantage of possibly being true. Insofar as men and women are physical creations, their central purpose is the production of more human beings. Women are therefore fashioned in body and mind to make and nurture children and men to protect and support those children during their relatively long maturation period. 
all societies shaped themselves around these necessities. They created structures that formalized gender roles and attempted to ensure the paternity of children so that men would care for their own. In many societies, these structures became increasingly ritualistic and oppressive for women. But the opposite happened in the Christian West. Why? Take a look at your Bible, Proverbs 31. The biblical ideal of a good woman is not only strong, kind, and wise, she's also a creative and economic dynamo. Christianity sanctified motherhood in the person of Mary and celebrated women's fortitude and virtue in the female saints. The church created a version of marriage intended to protect women and designed the philosophy of chivalry, which instructed men to use their superior strength for women, not against them. Individuals can be incredibly abusive to one another, men and women both. But over time, Christendom tended to elevate, protect, and ultimately include women as women in the great enterprise of Western civilization. Now, the developments of modernity have created special challenges for women. Industry removed clothing and food production from the home to the factory, and thus deprived homemakers of their traditional businesses. Children lost their monetary value to parents by leaving home to fend for themselves. So, while motherhood and homemaking remain the most important spiritual activities of humankind, modernity has stripped those enterprises of their former economic power. But in a Western civilization dedicated to equal rights, these challenges come along with fresh opportunities. New technologies and effective birth control allow individual women to tailor gender roles to their personal liking or abandon them altogether. None of this is a reason to attack men. In fact, these new opportunities are largely the result of men's inventions and their ideas. And none of it requires women to abandon the femininity which is one of the graces of our world. It's just change and progress, that's all. With honest thought and goodwill, we can adapt over time without the angry, bitter, and dishonest attacks on our human nature by feminists. I'm Andrew Claven for Prager University. And then, of course, we take a look at the bitter, angry attacks against a white Christian man named Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Now, of course, we had the hearing last week. We're only going to play one segment from the hearing. You've probably already seen it already. U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina questioned Judge Kavanaugh and then had a conniption against his uh, fellow senators, uh, the ones on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats. So let's take a look at that right now because then we're going to actually get a follow-on explanation. Uh, but let's take a look at the clip first. Um, are you aware that at 923... On the night of July the 9th, the day you were nominated to the Supreme Court by President Trump, Senator Schumer said, 23 minutes after your nomination, I will oppose Judge Kavanaugh's nomination with everything I have. I have a bipartisan, and I hope a bipartisan majority will do the same. The stakes are simply too high for anything less. Well, if you weren't aware of it, you are now. Did you meet with Senator Dianne Feinstein on August 20th? I did meet with Senator Feinstein. Did you know that her staff had already recommended a lawyer to Dr. Ford? I did not know that. Did you know that her and her staff had this alleg allegations for over 20 days? I did not know that at the time. If you wanted an FBI investigation, you could have come to us. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold this seat open, and hope you win in 2020. You've said that, not me. You've got nothing to apologize for. When you see Sotomayor and Kagan, tell them that Lindsey said all oh, because I voted for them. I would never do to them what you've done to this guy. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. Are you a gang rapist? No. I cannot imagine what you and your family have gone through. Boy, y'all want power. God, I hope you never get it. I hope the American people can see through this sham that you knew about it and you held it. You had no intention of protecting Dr. Ford. None. She's as much of a victim as you are. God, I hate to say it because these have been my friends. 
But let me tell you, when it comes to this, you're looking for a fair process. You came to the wrong town at the wrong time, my friend. Do you consider this a job interview? It, it, the advice and consent role is like a job. Do you interview. consider that you've been through a job interview? I've been through a process of advice and consent under the Constitution. Which Would has, you say you've been through hell? I, I've been through uh, hell and then some. This is not a job interview. Yeah. This is hell. This, this, this is going to destroy the ability of good people to come forward because of this crap. Your high school yearbook. You have interacted with professional women all your life, not one accusation. You're supposed to be Bill Cosby when you're a junior and senior in high school. And all of a sudden, you got over it. It's been my understanding that if you drug women and rape them for two years in high school, you probably don't stop. Here's my understanding. If you lived a good life, people would recognize it like the American Bar Association has the gold standard. His integrity is absolutely unquestioned. He is the very circumspect in his personal conduct, harbors no biases or prejudices. He's entirely ethical, is a really decent person. He is warm, friendly, unassuming. He's the nicest person, the ABA. The one thing I can tell you, you should be proud of, Ashley, you should be proud of this, that you raised a daughter who had the good character to pray for Dr. Ford. To my Republican colleagues, if you vote no, you're legitimizing the most despicable thing I have seen in my time in politics. You want this seat? I hope you never get it. I hope you're on the Supreme Court. That's exactly where you should be. And I hope that the American people will see through this charade. And I wish you well. And I intend to vote for you. And I hope everybody who's fair-minded will. Uh, Senator so if you and so that was uh, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham a week ago. Now, he was questioned. It was a nice question and answer session uh, at the... Um, uh, the, the Atlantic um, Festival. The Atlantic Magazine puts on an annual festival. This is, I think, their 10th year. And editor-in-chief uh, Jeff Goldberg uh, had you know, brought in politicians. It was held in D.C., plenty of access there. And, I mean, Hillary Clinton was there, so it's not just a one-sided affair, uh, whereas, you know, people from both parties show up and they get like a half an hour to, you know, to uh, get a Q&A session. And Lindsey Graham was invited. And he actually, we're going to play one segment here of him explaining his outrage. Because Goldberg kind of made the claim that, well, this is just political theater, that you were just trying to show the president. And here's what Lindsey Graham had to say. So if you hold this against him, um, I think that is the most pardon unfair me for my, thing. Pardon me for my cynicism here, but this goes to, yeah. this goes to, to Judge Kavanaugh uh, that day, and it also goes to you a little bit. There's a feeling, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a feeling that a lot of that was performance directed at the person who may or may not be watching the Atlantic Festival at yeah. this moment. Well, let me, let would, me, you say, yeah. would you say, in, 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 yeah. our, in this new framework, anger yeah. is rewarded yeah, right. and buttressed yeah. rather than civil yeah. discourse and right. so yeah. that's infecting the process yeah. of picking a yeah. justice and it will affect yeah. the Supreme Court. So I mean, am I, am I fair in saying that you were directing some of that toward the president? Your anger? To the president. So showing the president, no, we're, we're standing no, and fighting in a way that we know you I like. I think you're cheapening me and that's fine. I don't really no, care. I would never so, cheapen no, no, you. No, you are. No, you are. You're suggesting that the reason I got mad was for some political play. The reason I got mad, I, no, 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 let him go, let him go, please. The reason I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan was because I thought it made sense. The reason I came to his defense is because I thought he was being treated like crap. This is America. Turn to Don McGahn and tell him, if you're truly innocent, that you want to ex continue this and have your family torn apart. That was too much for me. So here's the game here. 
when I'm voting for two female nominees nominated by the Democrat, I'm the smartest freaking guy in town. I'm the epitome of what a good Republican would be like. When I defend somebody I know for 20 years against a complete character assassination, all of a sudden it's about Lindsay. The reason I did what I did is because I wanted to let the country know that if this is the new normal, God help the next person who follows Brett Kavanaugh. I wanted the country to know that in this country, you don't have to turn and prove anything. You don't, if, you, if you're not asking for the cops to investigate you more you're guilty, it's probably not the way to go. I've seen Democratic senators say, I believe her before he ever spoke. I've been a lawyer most of my life. That's not the way it works. I don't know what the standard should be. Biden had it pretty well right. So here's what's happened. I said what I thought I needed to say at a time I thought it needed to be said. So that was Senator Lindsey Graham on October 3rd at the uh, Atlantic Festival. Needs a lot, makes a lot of sense. Now, if you notice the Prager University, we're talking about feminism and their anti-male agenda and you see what happened with Brett Kavanaugh now here's Lindsey Graham's explanation this has a way of moving the polls because we are only 33 days away from the midterm elections that has to be into consideration of course this is really what everything is all about can the Democrats stall and delay stall and delay which well, stalling and delaying are the same thing um, through the election. Can they try to squeeze this out for 33 more days and then hope that the voters will reward them at the polls to give them a few more Senate seats and take the majority and then they can have a better opportunity to get a more moderate uh, Supreme Court justice. That's what this is all about. But then they're using feminism to you know, quash that. That's what this whole thing is about. But now, how do voters react at the polls? And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the day, of the uh, hour, talking about. Because we can go back in midterm elections, and, and I'm only going to look today at midterms because that's what we're in. I'm not going to look at presidential elections, um, you know, as the as way the polling is and how you can extrapolate that into looking at what the people are thinking and what the battle battleground landscape is for campaigns. And this is all tied in with what is called the generic congressional vote, which essentially is which party do you trust? If you're going to vote for a member of Congress today, would it be a Republican or a Democrat or an other? And really they throw out the others and then here's what you have is a disparity between Republicans and Democrats. That's the generic congressional. But that's a good indication of what the turnout model is going to be. Now, two years ago, we spent a great deal of time discussing the internal workings of polls, how they are conducted, uh, who conducts them, what kind of questions are asked, what some of their methodology is, what's used and what should be used. I mean, we covered that two years ago. But now we're going to take a look at the generic congressional because that is the turnout model. If you, you, know, you look at the internals of any poll out there and you, you'll see you know, the Democrats are you know, 5 or 7 or 11 points uh, more than the Democrats. No, that is correct. That's the uh, generic congressional. That's from 2002. Oh, on that particular one, they, they messed that up. But, but, now, but what we're going to take a look here is not so much the specific numbers. We're going to look at the averages here, and we're going to look at a couple of them, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at this on an individual poll base. This is the weighting, but what I want to point out is, is two things. One, the difference in the spread between the RCP average, Real Clear Politics is where this is from, Real, realclearpolitics.com, and what the average of the polls measures out to with the final results of the polls, because there is a sampling bias error in there. And, it, and it's on the average. It's not necessarily on, a, on an individual poll. The other thing we're going to look at is specific incidents 
that drive voters. So here we're taking a look at the 2002 generic congressional vote. If you see uh, on your screen, the RCP average is Republicans uh, plus 1.7, and then the final result, Republicans plus 4.6. Well, that seems to be a little off, doesn't it? Because it's a 2.9% bias in favor of the Democrats. Well, in um, October, around this time, or I think it was like October 5th, uh, let's see the next, okay. Yeah, if we can look around the 5th, uh, you'll see Democrats plus four, Democrats plus two. You know, that, that's kind of what the trend is, is you have all these different polling firms reporting their numbers. Uh, CBS News, New York Times, D plus four. Pew Research, D plus two. CNN, USA Today, Gallup, D plus one. And if you look at how they actually called it, at least CNN, USA Today, and Gallup, they are an R plus six on the final. And the Republican finals uh, are pl uh, plus 4.6. CBS News, New York Times, R plus 7. Uh, Ipsos, Reed Cook was an R plus 2. Rasmussen reports did not have a uh, generic congressional then. Um, but something happened on October 25th. And that was the death of Minnesota Senator Paul Wellstone. Yes, that 16th uh, anniversary is coming up at the end of the month. October 25th, 11 days out from the election. And at that point in time, that's where the Democrats were. I mean, it, it, it. okay, there we go. So the Democrats at the time of the plane crash were up by three, up by four, according to some of the polls, CNN, Time, Democracy Corps. And that was probably, I was deployed overseas, so I wasn't even here for that. But that was, from what I was gathering, that was pretty accurate. The Democrats had a slight lead. But then something happened, and that was on the 29th of October of 2002. You had Paul Wellstone's funeral, and this is what happened. I am begging you, please, let the people of this state hear your voice on his behalf to keep his legacy alive and help us win this election for Paul Wellstone. For Paul Wellstone, will you stand up and keep fighting for social and economic justice? Say yes! As energetic as Senator Wellstone was, I don't think he would have appreciated that, honestly. And of course, the Democrats backtracked from that right away. They were embarrassed by the whole moment. Jesse Ventura, then governor, walked out. Uh, if you were around back then, you remember that incident because that happened here. The voters took a backlash against the Democratic Party. Because that's when the momentum switch really occurred from a lean Democrat on the turnout into a uh, propel the Republican uh, advance. That is what saved the GOP's hide in 2002. That is how they were able to pick up two U.S. Senate seats and eight U.S. House seats. Or, yeah, eight U.S. House seats. I think it was eight. Yeah. That, that was how the Republican Party managed to make it through the 2002 election, thanks to the Democrats overreaching. Granted, it was a motion. I'm not going to fault them for venting a little bit, but there is still a certain decorum in politics that you don't use a funeral to be a campaign rally. And if John McCain's funeral would have been an election rally for the Republicans, I guarantee you that the momentum shift would have very quickly gone in favor of the Democrats. Republicans learned that lesson from what they saw happening in 2002. They haven't forgotten, and that's why McCain's uh, funeral was not an election year rally for the GOP. It was a recognition of John McCain, as well it should be. So that was what propelled the Republicans to victory in 2002. Now, let's take a look at 2006, which was a really good Democrat year. That was the generic congressional. 
according to the Real Clear Politics average, um, the Democrats had an 11.5% lead in the average of polls, but the final was a plus 7.9%. So that was 3.6% in favor of the Democrats. So you had 2002 is 2.9% polling uh, bias in favor of the Democrats, or poll, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm going to call it a bias. 2.9% um, in favor of the Democrats in 2002, and 3.6% in favor of the Democrats in 2006. So the RCP average on the generic congressional has been running you know, a little over 3% higher in favor of the Democrats in these two midterm polls. Let's take a look here at what happened in um, September, September 19th. Let's take a look at the next slide. So there it is, 11.5% uh, with Democrats uh, on the average, with 79 in the final. Uh, and this is, of course, taken from Real Clear Politics. Now go back, go back one. Uh, notice the trends when you see Democrats plus 18, plus 22, plus 15, plus 23, and then it shrinks a little bit, but it was still a large lead. Now, if we can go uh, to the next slide, okay, and then pause it there. Now, let's take a look at, first of all, where we were on the 15th to 17th, right at the bottom of the screen. It was a tie, and then Democrats jumped out to a 10-point lead. Um, what happened on September 19th was Republican Congressman Mark Foley was implicated in a scandal. It was a gay sex scandal. And at that point in time, the Democrats had a plus 6.5% lead in the RCP average. Then he resigned on September 29th, and that pushed it up to a D plus 11 and then on October 22nd, the State Department had an official apology for the Iraq War. And then on October 23rd, the Enron scandal trials had uh, ended uh, with Ken Lay and uh, Jeff Skilling. Jeff Skilling was uh, sentenced to, I believe, 24 years in prison. And that pushed the Democrats to a plus 16.6 percent lead with uh, two weeks before the election, and even though the Republicans closed the gap at the end, that was not enough. The RCP average was, um, was uh, as I mentioned, 11.5%. The final was 79 The result was that the Democrats had taken six Senate seats and 31 House seats. Um, the closest ones to reality were the USA Today Gallup poll, the ABC News, uh, and they had D plus 7. ABC News, Washington Post was D plus 6. And then Pew Research was D plus 4. Uh, then at this point in time, in the beginning of October, uh, it, AP Ipsos had D plus 10. Pew Research had D plus 13. CNN had D plus 11. And so it's important to see how these polls change with the generic congressional. And that was the year it was 3.6% in favor of the Democrats, higher than it really was in reality, but still, that was a blue wave election. The Democrats picked up a lot of seats. That was the midterm election when George W. Bush was uh, in his second term. And the Republicans and Democrats, even though the Democrats did have a lead, they were still pretty close together until the Mark Foley scandal broke, and then there was no turning back. Re the Democrats went on to win. Republicans got their clock clean, but they haven't forgotten. So now we're going to move on, and then we're going to take a look right now at um, an interview with Mark Foley. And he, this interview he had conducted uh, two years after the scandal. So this is 2008 when this was taken. And I believed I owed my constituents, you know, a apology of what happened. I embarrassed them, and I embarrassed my family. Anytime your life goes out of control, it's as a result of an addiction of some sort. You know, there are a multitude of reasons you can come up with, but you still have to accept responsibility, and that's one of the things I want to do. I don't want anybody to ever say, well, he blamed it on, because at the end of the day, you do have to take personal accountability. It's why I resigned. I understood right up front. A lot of other people tried to slug it out. Oh, I can explain this to my constituents. I can get them to understand it. 
I didn't understand it myself. I couldn't understand how I let this happen. And that was what was sad to me. You know, I think people can read for themselves or understand for themselves how this came to the public domain. It wasn't as a result of a complaint by someone, per se. It was a, uh, it was a email that appeared in the middle of a, a very contentious election cycle. And so it doesn't help to blame. I wrote the email or the instant message. It was never an email. I wrote the instant message. So th it doesn't make sense to say, well, it was a democratic operative plan. I have to take that responsibility. In politics, good and bad, you have to accept the fate dealt you. And so I'm not going to put a fine point on who did it and how they did it, because at the end of the day, again, I wrote the instant message. And it was Mark Foley who, through that scandal, gave the Democrats a tremendous advantage in the 2006 midterm elections. Now, 2010, the, President Obama had taken office, 2009. So he'd been in office for almost two years. And that was a Republican year. Uh, in October, well, let's take a look at the, at the graph. So if you notice now, in, the, um, in August, September, October, so notice now how we had the Democrats did have a substantial lead, but the Republicans caught up and then propelled on to victory. So now the question we have is what caused that? Uh, first, I'm going to bring in the uh, sampling error, and this was 2.6% in favor of the Republicans. So if you see the Republicans' RCP average was 9.4, the final was 6.8. You got a couple of polls. The uh, Rasmussen, in this case, uh, they they were wrong. They had Republicans plus 12. Gallup had Republicans plus 15, and really it was Republicans plus 6.8. And I really believe that this was a case where the pollsters knew that the Republicans had an advantage, but they had a hard time accurately gauging it. Um, taking a look at what happened here? Um, I got my notes here. Uh, 2010. First of all, July 3rd. If we can go back to that graph, I'm going to just point out a um, couple of things. Um, July 3rd, the uh, Republican National Committee Chairman Michael Steele was criticized by Democrats for calling the Afghan, uh, Afghanistan uh, campaign the War of Obama's Choosing. And that rallied the Republican base. The Democrats had a 0.3 advantage, and then within a couple of days, the Republicans had a 1.7% advantage. So that was a 2% change in a matter of a couple of days in July. So you, if you look at July on there, you, you'll see a little bit of, of separation. Then on July 15th, CBS and NBC had censored the Kill the Ground Zero Mosque ad by the group the National Republican Trust. This outraged Republicans, and they took off to a 3.6% advantage. September 1st, Obama met with Middle Eastern leaders in pursuit of the peace process uh, for Israel and Palestine, and that motivated the Republican base. And they went up to a 0.6.7% advantage. And then on September 24th, as we were getting close to the end, this really was the final separation, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton met with the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, and Republicans got motivated, and that was an 8.2% advantage in the uh, generic congressional in 2010. Now let's take a look at the next slide. And uh, so there's kind of the trends when you see the Republicans are gaining in the trend line. Uh, let's go to the next one. And let's take a look at where they were at the beginning of, August, of October, kind of where we're at in the midterms. Um, around this time, CBS News had R plus 8. ABC News Washington Post poll had R plus 6. Now, the most accurate pollsters, because uh, it was the final of R6.8, uh, Reuters Ipsos was R plus 6, Pew Research was R plus 6, ABC News Washington Post poll was R plus 4, 
Rasmussen was still, as we pointed out, they were uh, really off. Uh, they have since adjusted and gotten a lot better, uh, but they had an R plus 12 for the final, which was way out. That was like three points uh, ahead of where it was. And, the, and at the end of the day in 2010, uh, the Republicans picked up six, six Senate seats and 63 House seats. That was an overwhelming thumping. That was uh, double the number of House seats that the Democrats had taken just uh, four years prior. So now we're going to take a look now at uh, the Ground Zero Mosque, uh, Kill the Ground Zero Mosque um, ad that was censored. This is the one that... Uh, CBS and NBC had censored, and that was really controversial at the time. Let's take a look at what the ad had to really say. On September 11th, they declared war against us. And to celebrate that murder of 3,000 Americans, they want to build a monstrous 13-story mosque at Ground Zero. This ground is sacred. Where we weep, they rejoice. That mosque is a monument to their victory and an invitation for more. A mosque at Ground Zero must not stand. The political class says nothing. The politicians are doing nothing to stop it. But we Americans will be heard. Join the fight to kill the Ground Zero Mosque. Go to GOPtrust.com. Paid for by National Republican Trust PAC, which is... Now, I know that that was hugely controversial at that time. I remember that. Uh, but that did have in, in, the, the censoring. Now, if CBS and NBC would have just run the ad... I don't think it would have made much of a difference in the polls. Now, of course, that depends on how much the Republican National Trust or uh, the Na you know, National Republican Trust would have actually had to pay in, in future ad buy. But the ad itself, if it would have just run, it wouldn't have had that much. I mean, it would have been outrageous, but it would have been a short-term duration. It was the perpetual news cycles over this ad that impacted the polls. And that was real or perceived on what was you know, being talked about. It was the fact that there was even discussion about a mosque at Ground Zero. A lot of people across this country, who, especially Republicans, were upset about that. That one ad and getting censored had a lot to do with bringing that into the discussion. And we're only nine years away from 9-11 and people hadn't forgotten. And so that was a stark reminder. And that made a difference in that election cycle. So anyhow, moving on to the 2014 campaign. Uh, 2014, the um, sampling error was 3.3% in favor of the Democrats. Again, after the anomaly from 2010, we kind of got back into that normal Republican up and down, Democrat up and down cycle. Neither side was really taking much of an advantage. And if you notice down the graph, a lot of times the, the polls are kind of moving the same way. If the Republicans are moving up, the Democrats are moving up. If the Republicans are moving down, the Democrats are moving down, and vice versa. And so there was really no way of getting some separation. Now, if you notice that big, large bubble when the Democrats were above 46%, uh, that was October of 2013, so a year before the midterms. That was when Obamacare had launched and the, the um, government shutdown in 2013 occurred. That was what, 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 how the public was responding. And then on November 5th, so, you know, the rise up started on November 1st. And then the beginning of the end of that bubble uh, occurred on no around November 5th. Uh, Chris Christie won his re-election in his governor of New Jersey. Uh, Ken Cuccinelli uh, narrowly lost the race for Republican governor of Virginia. So uh, McAuliffe won that race by a very thin margin. And the Republicans 
fared better at the polls in the off-year election than had been expected. And then you couple that with the problems with the Obamacare rollout, and then, and then it was announced that only 20, after like six weeks, only 27,000 people in a land of 320 plus million people had signed up. Well, that was a huge drop for the Democrats. I mean, all of those up. And things just kind of went back to normal. Uh, then the beginning of June, let's go back to that graph again. In the beginning of June is when you started seeing the GOP rise again, and that was when you had the um, rise of ISIS. And the polls were reflecting that. As ISIS was in the news, you know, that's when the polls went up and down, and there still wasn't really a lot of separation until September 2nd. And that was when ISIS released a video of the beheading of journalist Stephen uh, Sadoff. Uh, at that time, the Democrats had a point, uh, let's see, a 1.5 percent advantage, and then the GOP had peaked at R plus four when the airstrikes had begun in uh, mid October. But then, by that time, there was enough of a separation that the Democrats could not recover. That was 2014 midterms. So let's take a look at the uh, at the actual numbers. So here we have. The uh, final results, Republicans 5.7%. The RCP average was Republicans 2.4%. And that turned out to be a 3.3% uh, disparity in favor of the Democrats. You notice what's happening here is that the, the polling data is favoring the Democrats more so than the actual ground game by 3.3 percent and really if you take out 2010 and look at that as an anomaly because everybody knew the Republicans were, were uh, had the momentum but it was just hard to gauge but your 2002 2006 and 2014 the pollsters were pretty you know doing the same thing and the average is 3.3 percent amongst all three of those polls that's what that that oversampling bias is uh, as the community uh, the cumulative nature of the polls, not any individual specific poll. At the beginning of October, uh, October 4th, CBS News had R plus 6. Rasmussen declared it a tie. And you can even see that on that page. There's Rasmussen tie, and then Republicans plus 6. It was 49-43. And Democrats plus 2 in uh, the previous Rasmussen. Um, so there was some momentum there with the Democrats going down, the Republicans coming up uh, at the beginning of October. And the, in the final, the ABC News Washington Post poll, they were the most accurate. They had R plus 6. CBS News had R plus 8. AP GFK poll had R plus 8. And Rasmussen was R plus three, and again the final, uh, the, the average final was 2.4 for uh, the Republicans, and the final vote was 5.7 for the Republicans. Um, that's kind of how the polls were going. And what were those lift points? You know, we just um, did we cover those? Yeah, we did. I mean, yet. You know, it was really ISIS. You know, ISIS is what did it. And of course, there were just you know, there are always other factors at work, but those are the really the major lift points. And that's important to keep in mind is that there are lift points. And so we're going to take a look right now, just as a memory jogger, of the news reporting that occurred in October of 2013 with the government shutdown in Washington. Washington, D.C. is a federal city in the most literal sense, the seat of the United States government. So what happens when the federal government shuts down? Well, first I wanted to naturally walk around um, this area and see the sights, and so I was had no idea what was going on today and wanted to snap a photo, but it's all closed off. Yeah, I've never been to DC before, it's my first time, so I would have liked to have gone closer, but it is what it is. 
DC's largest tourist attractions, the monuments, the national parks, the Smithsonian, they're all closed. In addition, DC is home to tens of thousands of federal employees, many of whom are furloughed. A trip on DC's metro system confirms this. Normally, crowded platforms have become veritable ghost towns. We were told yesterday that we would have to come in for four hours, um, and then we would be furloughed for the other four if the furlough um, went into effect. So I'm actually on my way to work so that I can close out my machine and whatnot, and um, then I'll leave at 1.30 and go home. But worry about it? Can't worry. We'll just take one day at a time. I'm non-essential, but I came in to turn on my out-of-office away message and shut down and lock up. I'm especially in a unique situation because I only started working three weeks ago. I just moved here um, from Boston, so it's kind of ridiculous to move for a new job and work for three weeks and then get furloughed. Yeah, it's such a horrible waste of time, energy, money. Instead of actually doing the work that we're here to do, we've been planning for worst case scenario. A federal city with no federal workforce? It's an identity crisis and a one-two punch on the D.C. economy that had been largely sheltered from the economic crisis. Local businesses are already suffering from decreased foot traffic. We have employees and we have families. If this continues, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, we need to make money. We're here Tuesdays and Fridays and we get, you know, uh, I would say about 90 percent. I would say 90%, especially this, it's a federal building area. So, yeah, 90% of our, our customers are federal. Back on what would normally be a packed national mall, the Washington Monument, icon of the city, would be closed if it weren't already fenced off for reconstruction, an apt symbol for the federal city as it currently stands. So, again, that was a situation where the Obama team managed to, you know, with the help of their friends in the media, ended up blaming the Republicans for the government shutdown, and it stuck, and the voters believed it. But that was a year before the midterms, and so there was plenty of times for the GOP to recover, and they did, as, you know, we saw when they had gained nine Senate seats in uh, 2014 and 13 House seats. So there was time to recover. And what was that recovery? That was ISIS. And so what we're going to show right now, we're going to do these next two back to back. Uh, the first one is going to be what is ISIS and what do they want in Iraq? Uh, that's uh, followed up by President Obama talking about Stephen Ornloff, who was the uh, journalist beheaded by ISIS. Once again, Iraq is in complete turmoil. This time it all centers on a group called the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, commonly referred to as ISIS. Now you'd have to be a scholar on Iraq and Syria to fully understand this conflict, so we can't explain everything. But we can tell you enough to contextualize all of the news stories you've been hearing lately. So the next time someone says ISIS, you can say, oh yeah, I know those guys, they're horrible terrorists. So who is ISIS and what do they want? Well, they're a jihadist militant group with strongholds in both Iraq and Syria, as you can see on this map. But they're not stopping there. Their goal is to obtain more land so they can create their own nation. Their dream country would look something like this, and it would be called the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. So who are the fighting members of ISIS? Well, that's where it gets complicated. Iraq breaks down into three major groups, Sunni Arabs, Shiite Arabs, and Kurds. ISIS members are Sunni Arabs, as was Saddam Hussein. His regime was Sunni-backed. So does that mean this is just the old guard taking back power? No. Saddam Hussein was a secularist. ISIS, on the other hand, is a militant jihadist group that wants strict Sharia law. This was not the desire of Hussein's regime, although there are signs that some of Saddam's former forces are currently working with ISIS. It's complicated, and in Syria, it gets even more complicated. Syria's war crime committing government is currently fighting a civil war against various rebel groups. ISIS is not one of those rebel groups, but ISIS does want to take over most of Syria, so they are in some degree of armed conflict with both the Syrian government and the rebels. It's pure chaos. In short, ISIS has been committing acts of violence and terrorism in both Syria and Iraq for a while, and they're only now making the news for one simple reason. They're winning. 
Militarily speaking, ISIS is the most successful jihadist group the world has ever seen. They're collecting taxes from businesses, setting up infrastructure, and releasing quarterly reports. They're gaining strength so they could be around for a long time, and they may be a bigger threat to the surrounding areas in the long run than Al-Qaeda. Let us know in the comments what you think of ISIS, and if you'd like to learn more about the current state of Islam, check out our video on what the true meaning of the word jihad is. The answer is much more positive than you might think. Or click on the other box to get up-to-date information on the current lethal injection debacle. And remember, we post new episodes every single day, so please, please, please subscribe. We are new and we can always use the support. I want to say that today the prayers of the American people are with the family of a devoted and courageous journalist, Stephen Sotloff. Overnight, our government determined that tragically Stephen was taken from us in a hor horrific act of violence. Like Jim Foley before him, Steve's life stood in sharp contrast to those who murdered him so brutally. They make the absurd claim that they kill in the name of religion, but it was Stephen, his friends say, who deeply loved the Islamic world. His killers try to claim that they defend the oppressed, but it was Stephen who traveled across the Middle East, risking his life to tell the story of Muslim men and women demanding justice and dignity. Whatever these murderers think they'll achieve by killing innocent Americans like Stephen, uh, they have already failed. They failed because, like people around the world, Americans are repulsed by their barbarism. We will not be intimidated. Their horrific acts only unite us as a country and stiffen our resolve to take the fight against these terrorists. And those who make the mistake of harming Americans will learn that we will not forget and that our reach is long and that justice will be served. So that was what happened back in 2014, just a, a little over, well, about six weeks, six to eight weeks away from the midterm election. The perception with President Obama was that he was soft on the Middle East and his policies, and we've covered this many times on the show. You know, when dealing with ISIS, he called them a JV team. Uh, he pulled us out of Iraq. He was trying to pull us out of Afghanistan. And then all of a sudden, ISIS comes up, and Obama got a lot of the blame for that. And as a result, any time that there was something, uh, a story about the Middle East, President Obama was not looking good. And the Republicans were rallying behind that you know, call. And then keep in mind, also in 2014, the U.S. Senate was up for grabs. And that was another focus for the GOP, was that they felt that they could get the Senate. They had the House, they wanted to get the Senate, so then they wanted to get the White House, which is what they eventually did. So that's, those are some of those pivot point moments in the previous midterm elections that made a deter were a determining factor in the outcome of the election. And now here we are in 2018. And in the few moments we've got left, first let's take a look at the graph for the current election. So there is a huge disparity there. And now if you notice in the upper right corner it says uh, plus 7.7. .7. That was actually as of yesterday. It's, uh, as of today, it's 7.2. So the Democrats have fallen by 0.5 in one day as another generic congressional poll is added. Yes, the moment, momentum for the Democrats has been there throughout the entire year and even in the last year. And that's pretty much undisputed. Even my Republican friends noticed that. But something happened in the last couple of weeks, and that was this whole Judge Kavanaugh thing. The Democrats have peaked at 7.7. .7, and, you know, and last year they were up on like 12 and 13, but they've peaked at 7.7, .7, and now Republicans are engaged in the midterm elections like we haven't seen in a long, long time. So is this a pivot point 33 days out? Are we going to see that these trend lines reverse? 
that the Republicans take a lead or are very, very close at the end? Are they going to close that gap? Now, keep in mind, it's 7.7 on the uh, 7.2 on the RCP average, and if you actually account for if you account for the or the 3.3 percent uh, oversampling of Democrats on on the average, it's really a 3.9 percent. If this holds true. 3.9% Democrat advantage instead of a 7.2, and that does reflect the impact of a motivated GOP base. So let's take a look right now at something that Lindsey Graham had to say yesterday. And here's what's happened on our side. Whether you're a Trump Republican, a Bush Republican, a McCain Republican, a libertarian or a vegetarian, you're pissed. I've never seen the Republican Party so unified as I do right now. The defining issue in 2018 has changed. It's about this. Republicans across the board, country club, Tea Party, you name it, believe this was way over the top. And I can tell you as a member of the body who's tried to work across the aisle, and on occasion got people on my side mad, that this cannot be the new normal because it will destroy the ability to get people to come forward and be judged. The president is and so that was Senator Graham yesterday, and he's right. Republicans are upset. And this is a defining issue in the polls. Now, you, I think the Democrats know that they're losing on this issue. I think they see this, they feel it, because now we're going back into President Trump's tax returns and how much money he inherited from his father, and we're trying to create a new scandal because the Democrats know that they're losing the momentum on this. The vote on Kavanaugh is Saturday, and then after that, they're going to find another scandal or something to try to get that momentum back. And whether or not they succeed, or whether the Republicans continue the momentum, or whether the Republicans screw up the momentum, that's what we want to watch for in the next month in the uh, news cycle. Because a lot of this news right now is being driven specifically by the midterm elections. So if we see more uh, attacks coming out, especially if they're unsubst unsubstantiated, that's going to be poll-worthy. And that's what happens when you're a month away, 33 days away from a midterm election. There are pivot point moments, but there's also a sampling bias. And those are really the two things I wanted to mention today is in a little bit more on how to read the landscape and how to read the news cycle. Because this is what people vote on. Yes, you have the negative ads out there. I actually tune most of them out. I mean, I'll play one of them here and there on the show. But really, I don't even, uh, I don't even really watch television as much anymore than I used to. But, I, you know, anytime I do turn on the TV, there's another negative attack ad. Both sides do it. Both sides are trying to play the same game there. But really, the thing that's important is the news cycle. But then also remember that the polls usually skew Democrat, and they're not necessarily an accurate picture of the truth. And that's one thing that we're all about here on this show is the truth. What is the truth? And we've been that way ever since day one back in 2014 when we started this. This is a search for the truth. We want to teach you a little bit more as to what's going on in Washington, what's going on in St. Paul, the news cycles. And I'll tell you one other thing real quick. Uh, the Democrats know that Keith Ellison in Minnesota is volatile. I mean, the DFL came out with their uh, attorney or an attorney tied to them with their investigation, and that was shown to be a sham, so they leaned on the Minneapolis Police Department, and they refused to take it up because of conflict of interest, and this gets delayed with Keith Ellison in the news longer than it should be. Anyhow, that's it for now. With uh, 81 more days left until Christmas, I'm Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.